solids can be classified into two categories. They could be known as crystalline solids, or they can also be known as amorphous solids. Crystalline solids are the ones that we're going to really talk about this time around. Uh, crystalline solids, what they do is they possess rigid and long-range order. And so what that means for us is that the atoms or molecules or ions they have a specific shape shape and they occupy specific positions. So the atoms and molecules and ions have a specific shape and occupy specific spe, occupy specific positions. Okay, and so the arrangement of those particles in a solid is going to be such that the net attractive intermolecular forces are at their maximum. So we try to make sure that we take advantage of all of the intermolecular forces. All right, so you, that's a crystalline solid. An amorphous solid lacks a well-defined arrangement and long-range molecular order. So that's pretty much how we're going to look at solids. Either they've got the shape that they are, they're supposed to have, or they don't. Okay, now for this time around, when we take a look at solids, we're going to really focus on crystalline solids. And if you go further into chemistry, then you'll start talking a little bit more about amorphous solids. So when we talk about solids, we really have to talk about this thing called the unit cell. And this is the basic repeating structural unit of a crystalline solid. And so if we're looking at a crystalline solid right here, what is the single repeating thing? What is the simple repeating unit that's constantly multiplied over and over? It's this. So this little this this prism here, this is your unit cell. Wow, what we're looking at over here, this is the unit cell stacked upon each other and next to each other. This would be your crystal. So this is your crystal structure. Okay. Now if we take a look at each, if we take a look at the unit cell, each corner of the unit cell has a specific name. And each corner we call a lattice point. Okay, so each dot or each corner represents an atom or a molecule or an ion, and we call that a lattice point. And almost every solid can be classified as one of seven types of unit cells, which we have right over here. Okay, so these are all the all the different types of unit cells that are possible. So you have cubic, you have rhombohedral, hexagonal, tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, and triclinic. Now to keep things simple for, for this time around, because time is of the essence, if we, if we had a little bit more time, we'd explore a little bit, but we're just going to keep it to the cubic system for this course. Okay. So that being said, if that's what your unit cell is going to look like, okay, think of a unit cell as a box that's filled with ping pong balls, okay? And there's a different way, there's a couple different ways that you can pack those ping pong balls into the box. And so if you think of it that way, of like stacking the ping pong balls one on top of another, Atoms are going to be are going to behave pretty much the same way as you would stack those ping pong balls in a box. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. All right, so we've got an example here where you've got one layer of ping pong balls. Okay. Now, if you notice, you've got nine balls right nine ping pong balls right here, and it looks like you've got crevices. You've got a space between the center ball, the center ping pong ball, and the outside balls. Okay, so it looks like you've got crevices of four. 
Now, you could, using those crevices, you could put another, if we were going to stack two layers of ping pong balls, you could actually put a, a series of ping pong balls right on these crevices. Okay, so that's one possible choice. Now, what we're assuming, though, in this picture is that we stack the ping pong balls right on top of one another. So the next layer would be covering up that first layer. Okay, and there's a rationale behind what, what we're doing, or why we're doing it that way, and I'll get to that. So that way, your unit cell would be, if we were to take just four of those unit cells, or four of those atoms, that's how we're defining a unit cell. And then one if we were to take, you know, make it try to make a prism out of those out of those eight atoms, here's what we got. So it looks like you it looks like you've got at each corner you've got part of another atom. Okay. And so that's that's kind of what we're looking at. So one thing that we can measure from this is called coordination number. So coordination number. This is going to be the number of atoms surrounding an atom in a crystal lattice. And it's a measure of how tightly packed the spheres are. The larger the number, the closer they're held together. Okay, so knowing that we're looking at just the cubic system, there's actually three different types that we, of packing that we could have. So again, think of that, uh, the unit cells at box, you're trying to put the ping pong balls in the box. There's for, for all intents and purposes right now, there's three ways of packing that box. One way is called the simple cubic system or the simple cubic cell. Okay, and we sometimes shorthand this as SCC, the simple cubic cell, where it has a coordination system, a co coordination number six, and how many atoms per unit cell? One. And so this simple cubic, this is actually the system we're looking at right now. So each corner is gonna be part or have at you know have a quarter of an atom so that way or i'm sorry an eighth of an atom so that way if you add up all the corners together you've got eight parts of an atom which should represent one whole atom the other way that we can define a, a cubic cell is the body centered cubic if I can spell cubic right. Okay, so the body center cubic or BCC, this differs from the simple cubic cell in that the second layer is going to fit into the crevices left by the first layer. So if we didn't pack the balls like we did the first time, but instead we're going to take advantage of those crevices left behind, okay, that would get us the body center cubic. And so this would have a coordination number of eight and because we can fit, you know, all the atoms are fitting into those cubuses, uh, those crevices, we actually can fit in another atom inside that cubic cell. Okay, so we've got two atoms per unit cell if we're dealing with bodies, uh, the body centered cubic. Finally, the other type that we're going to look at is called the face centered cell. Wow, I am having a hard time spelling today. Face centered cubic. Okay, so this has spheres at the center of each of the six faces of the cube along with the eight corner spheres so that way it has a coordination number 12 and it has four atoms per unit cell. And so the way that we're going, going from simple cubic to body centered to face centered, what we're looking at is we're pretty much investigating how these spheres are arranged together in space. 
Now, one other thing before I go on to that point, one other thing I want to think, you know, I kind of want to bring your attention to when you're looking at the types of unit cells. Essentially, we're asking us, we're asking ourselves this question, how many atoms can we squeeze into a unit cell? And so that's, that's pretty much what we're trying to answer with these three different ways of packing. We can, with a simple cubic, we can get one atom in. If we're in the body center, we can get two atoms in. If we got face centered, we've got four atoms. So like I said, all every time we're going to a new level, we're just trying to figure out, we're trying to investigate how we can arrange all these atoms together in space, in space or how do we pack, pack these atoms in. And we call this closest packing. closest packing. This is the most efficient arrangement of the atoms or the spheres. So how can we arrange all those atoms? Now, what's really cool is that we can use this information about the body centered, the face centered, and the simple cubic cell, knowing how many atoms are in each in each unit cell. We can actually calculate a lot of different properties about solids. So let me show you. So if you know that you've got face centered or body centered or simple cubic, we can actually figure out what the diameter, we could actually measure the, the length of each side. So we treat it as it's a cube. So that means each side would have the same length. We call that length A, okay? And if we know what kind of unit cell we're dealing with, we could actually calculate the radius of an atom. So what we're looking at here, you've got your different areas, you've got your different unit cells, simple cubic, body centered, face centered. And we've got three different ways of calculating for each unit cell, the radius based on the length of a cube. Now, what's really cool, I don't know if you guys are noticing, but right here for body center cubic, and then also the same thing for face center cubic, we are also using the Pythagorean theorem in order to help us figure out the relationship between the length of the unit cell and its radius. Okay, so this is a really, really nifty chart or a really nifty graphic to help us figure out that relationship between the length, which we're calling A on this picture, and the radius of an atom. Okay, so let's try a problem out. These problems seem really complicated, but as long as you sit down and think about things, it's not as bad as it seems. So let's try a problem out just to, just to see how it goes. So here's a problem. When silver crystallizes, it forms face-centered cubic cells. Okay. The unit cell edge length is 408.7 picometers. Calculate the density of silver. All right. So we know a couple things. We know we're dealing with face-centered cubic. Okay, and we know that the relationship between the length, the cell length, and the radius is that the length is going to be equal to four times the radius divided by the square root of three. Okay, so we know that. Now we also know A, in this case, the length is going to be 408.7 picometers. Okay, so what we want to know. We want to know two things. We want to know, we want to know the mass and we want to know the volume. Because once we know the mass and once we know the volume, that gives us density. Okay, so really, even though the problem is just going for density, we need to know the mass and the volume because remember density is going to be equal to the mass over the volume. 
So we got to have those two pieces first before we get density. All right. Now, you're probably sitting there going, what the? <laughs> I almost said, I almost said a bad word. <laughs> so you're probably sitting there going, what the, what the heck? What are we going to do? Like, how do we get mass? How do we get volume out of this? Well, it's actually not as bad as you think. All right, so mass, if you think about this face center cubic, you already know that this has four atoms, okay? By definition, face center cubic's got to have four atoms. So if that's the case, if you have four atoms and you know it's silver, okay, if we use the, if we use, uh, Avogadro's number. Wow, that was a that was a that was a brain fart right there. If we use Avogadro's number, six point zero two times ten to the twenty third atoms, we can actually convert that back to moles. Okay. And if we can, we know if we look at the periodic table, we can look at the molar mass of silver, which is going to be one hundred and seven point eight seven grams. Okay. So right off the bat, this is not a bad thing. So if we take 4 times 107.87 divided by Avogadro's number, that should give us something like 7.16 times 10 to the minus 22nd grams. So look, we already got a mass. All right, so what about the volume part? All right, so let's see how we can get that. Well, remember, if we go back to geometry, so yeah, this is like 10th grade stuff, so it might be a while. It might have, been a, might have been a hot minute since you had this. Remember that when we're talking about the volume of a cube, we define the volume as the length, which we're going to call A in this case, to keep, you know, to be in sync with these figures. That would just be the length cubed, length times width times height. Okay, so we know what that unit cell length is because it's this. It's 408.7 picometers. So if we were to cube that, we could get the volume. So um, one thing that we want to point out, though, usually when we measure volume, that volume is going to be centimeters cubed. We're in picometers. So before we do any cubing, because things get a little bit more complicated if we cube later, I mean, if we convert this later, we need to convert the, vol uh, the, the, the length from picometers to centimeters. So let's do that. So the length was 408.7 picometers. Okay, and if you remember the, the metric system, for every one meter, there's going to be 10 to the 12 picometers that make up one meter. Now we need to convert from meters to centimeters now. That one's a lot easier. There's 100 centimeters in one meter. So that way, the meters cancel out. We got centimeters. So if we take 408.7 times 100 and then divide it by 10 to the 12th, that should give us 4.087 uh, 4 times 10 to the negative eighth centimeters. Now, what we're going to do is take that value that we just have and we're going to cube it. So that way we get the volume of the unit, uh, the, the unit cell. So if we square that, if we cube that, we should get 6.82 times 10 to the minus 23rd cubic centimeters. Awesome. So look, we got our volume, we have our mass. So if we find density, which is density is equal to mass over volume, we know the mass is going to be 7.16 times 10 to the minus 22nd grams. The volume was 6.82 times 10 to the minus 23rd centimeters cubed. If we divide those two, we should get 10.50 grams per centimeter cubed. And there's your answer.